So it's now my pleasure to introduce to you Joy Muniz, Amir, uh, Amir Akani. <laughs> hey guys, you can be the number one ghost hunter in the world because uh, there's no such thing as ghosts, so it's, like, it works out fine. All right. Uh, <laughs> hey, so uh, this is like the, the fifth year where we've been here, right? So, uh, man, I definitely feel, uh, feel old now, and I think that's a little bit of the title of this talk is like, you know, old tech versus new adversaries. Um, you know, I was uh, I was talking to Joey, and uh, we're you know we're just uh, chatting on the phone, and we're talking about like all the new techniques adversaries are using. You know, now um, I don't know if you guys have seen there's like deep deep voice, deep fake, where people are using AI to bypass like facial recognition, voice systems. They're kind of using the best techniques, and technology is always trying to like stay one step ahead, right? They're always trying to like move up one point after another point, and we're like. That's cool, but what about if we go opposite? What about if we go completely old school and try and get the most oldest operating systems we can find and actually put critical services on them, critical information on them? And we're like, yeah, that sounds good, but can we, you know, like, how do we make it real world? So we actually like, spoke to some of our customers, we spoke to other, other places, and we're like, let's actually take some critical services, put them on the internet where you can actually like, lose money, like, actually m have a problem if these things get hacked, and see what the hell happens if we actually like, do this. And I'll, I'll let Joey kind of uh, fill in the rest of it. All right, yeah. So uh, that's really the uh, gist of what we're going to talk about now is old tech. Old tech is going to be various types of operating systems. To be clear, it's not going to be things like a, I don't know, like a PlayStation or some old thing that you can't use. It has to have like some usability to it. Like we actually chose operating systems that have capabilities. Before we go into more details of the talk, um, who are we? Uh, so again, I'm Joey. Uh, I work at Cisco. I'm an architect. Cover America, South America, and Canada for like security stuff. I got my blog, play soccer, etc. And my esteemed colleague. We used to work together years ago. All right, so I'm a, I'm a researcher. I actually uh, do a lot of exploit writing, a lot of zero-day uh, research, do a forensics, incident response, kind of all over, over the place. I blog like with Joey. We do a lot of things together as well. So me and Joey do a lot of independent research together. We do uh, independent books. But we worked on a number of projects. This is just, uh, just a couple of them. Of course, we've done our own stuff, but uh, like I said, we, we do a number of projects together, including our Raspberry Pi book, our web app book. Uh, we just uh, last year wrote a book on, on forensics, uh, and, uh, and that, that was great. Joey at Fortinet. I can't really promote a Cisco press book, so, so that was a little difficult, but that, that's okay. Um, so that's, that's us, and uh, Joey. Yeah. All right, so I'll keep this off. So. Yep, so this, these are the four things that we've done together. We're actually looking at doing another one next year as well. All right, so hypothesis, as was said, taking old technology and trying new malware against it. Like, again, cat and mouse game. Well, if the changes have happened so much, would the latest ransomware be able to respond to, like, Windows 3 or something is kind of the idea. Um, some interesting things with this is people would think, well, how did you test this? How did you use uh, technology to identify the threats? Why don't you use a sandbox? Well, sandboxes have to have templates. So most templates, if you talk to any vendor like Fortinet, for the, like Fortibox? Forty Sandbox. It's always Fort or something. Yeah. Or at Cisco, it's, um, it's Threat Grid. But like, they're always trying to keep the latest image. So what was funny was we were like, well, I wonder if we could ask the manufacturer, you know, the vendor, if we can have a template for like Windows 3 or for MS-DOS. And that's the way to get punched in the face. Like imagine going to the, you know, hey guys, I know you're really busy developing the latest Windows, but while you're you know, in, this, in your roadmap, do you mind kind of building a Windows 3? And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? So uh, there's no like real sandbox you can really do for this. So just think about like testing around the old operating system. So using like, like uh, snort signatures, basically things around it to actually see if the systems are infected, uh, changes on the operating system, et cetera, but there's no like traditional sandbox because you know, we're using really old stuff. Not to mention it was a pain in the ass and he'll be crying about that in the next five minutes about how painful it was uh, building these images. Uh, a lot of these images don't have the current technology that we have today, obviously. So trying to VMize these things is a pretty big challenge. Uh, I don't know if we're going to give away the images. I think that was kind of the plan eventually. But we may give away these images if you want them. But you're going to find in some cases you don't want the images because they were not worth using. Like immediately going online, they were pretty much raped. Um, but this is basically the hardware that was used, you know, a handful of stuff testing around it. So again, we can't use a sandbox. We're testing around it to try to identify if it's been breached. 
of the images we chose for this research project. Again, we could choose Commodore 64 or PlayStation, but there's no usability of this stuff. These are the ones that actually have usability. Uh, so basically MS-DOS, uh, like old version of, of uh, Apple or OS 2, and then some older versions of Windows. And the idea is, you know, which of these would actually be usable. For those that have to go early, this is basically the winner. So we'll talk about how awesome actually OS2 really is. Uh, and surprisingly, we'll even talk about how some people are actually still using this today it, with knowing they're using it because they're knowing it's actually somewhat secure. Um, as was mentioned, there's a ton of challenges. I'll let you kind of cry about this, but here's the challenges of actually building this. All right, so like, you know, when we first started building this, we're like, oh man, it'd be cool to like get an FTP server or like working on a NES classic, right? And, and that, that, that just uh, didn't really turn out to be any, any useful stuff. So we started off with networking and MS-DOS, like um, it, was just, it was just like a week before my time, okay? I'm not, uh, I'm not that young, but, uh, but it was, it, it, like I said, I never realized how, how freaking awful it is to get MS-DOS working in any usable way. So um, I had no idea MS-DOS didn't have a, like a, a TCP stack so you get it, you know you get that little black screen with the C colon on you, and then you're like ping, no ping found, no no apps found, and uh, so I had to go through all this documentation. I found uh, this thing called Lantastic. I don't know if you've used that. Like when I when I told like all my buddies about it, they're like, oh yeah, we had to go through that. It was like documentation sucked on it. It's no better now than it is. We found other other places like DOSBox and some other places where it was already virtualized, but we wanted to make changes to it, so it really didn't help us that you know there was like you know like computer archives or archives archive.com that had some of these things already on there, especially since we wanted to put our own things on their own apps on there. When we, when we had it, you know, when we had it running, the first thing is, it's like, oh, please enter date. And so, of course, you know, you know, you know, 0, 7, 11, uh, you know, 2019, it's like, please enter date. I was like, please enter date. You guys have yeah. the problem with date? Y2K! I was like, that shit was actually real. Like, I thought they were all lying to us. Like, I, I, that didn't matter. Uh, you have to do a date before 1999. It did ask for a four-digit date, but uh, it had to be before 1999. And um, so we'll get into a little bit of it here. But I will tell you, like, after we got, uh, got all this, like, time spending putting it on, actually got it running on a VMware and... You you know I was like cussing you out so many times I was like I was like like putting this on I was like f you Joey like uh, because uh, you, you know just when you when you when you put when you put the software in um, it crashes because the process is too fast so you have to manipulate that and then you you read all these articles you read all these blog blog sites and they tell you about ninety nine percent of the information and you get to that last one percent and the shit doesn't work it none of it like worked until you kind of figure it out on your own but once we actually got it working and then we actually put some usable software like SSH not SSH SSH servers, FTP servers, a web server, you know, a Telnet server on it. Um, about about six hours afterwards, people were like finding out it was MS-DOS, manipulating with it, and adding files, adding malware files to it. So I was like, who's going to figure this out? It's going to be so secure. Everyone's going to be like, do an map scan. I have no idea what it is. No, only six hours later, it only took them six hours to actually infect our device. Well, it depends on the model, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll start with it. So, yeah. So, again, we'll Depends on what we're talking about here. Like, uh, again, OS2, uh, Windows uh, XP, uh, the different mo uh, operating systems acted differently. But the first one we'll talk about is MS-DOS. So uh, MS-DOS, basically, you know, f uh, it has a ton of malware that's still out there, but the malware is very old. And it's still surprisingly heavily out on the internet. Well, like we said, like in six hours, we started getting these infections from really old malware, even though, like, we would think that, oh, maybe, like, this stuff would not find it. No, it found it. So that's MS-DOS. This is actually you know, it booting up in a VM system. Again, we may give some of these away, but the first one we saw within like a few hours, I think it was like about the six hour mark, was this casino malware. And basically, the interesting thing we found about this is, the malware in the past is not like malware now. All it does is screw with you. It's all like, it has no real big purpose. It's not like ransomware or some tactical thing. Um, like this, the second one, this LED one, we'll show you here. Uh, all it does is this. Oops. Let's see if it actually shows the video here. Oh, let's see if we can play the video. Oh, I'll play the video in a second. But basically, it just like flies around the screen. And like it's actually pretty clever the way they did it. They're actually able to like manipulate the, the visual and make, turn your screen into this big ass color thing or so. Um, the virus nader, I wonder if that one actually works. Damn, I may have to run this again here, here. Yeah, at the very end, I'll show you some of the videos. The virus nader is like, starts talking about like, like Terminator. It's like, I am the virus nader. I am a happy virus. I'm now going to go away. Thank you. 
It's just like annoying wear. That's all really it is. So all this like crazy ass annoying wear kept hitting the computer, which again, it took about eight, uh, six hours. We basically ran a few different images, put them online, see what would happen. And uh, yeah, the casino one, the Terminator version of it, all of those pretty much came up and uh, did its thing. So, so one of the things I'll add is like, uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, people are pretty smart enough. They, they figured out right away this is MS-DOS. In fact, it, it didn't take them long at all. And, and the thing about MS-DOS, I didn't really realize. So first of all, it has no real such thing as user permissions or file permissions. So first of all, if you're, if you're actually in an FTP system, you can do like CD, space, space, whatever, and you're, you're, in, you're in any directory you want to be. It won't stop you. It'll be like, go ahead, be in any directory you want to be in. And of course, people are going into like, uh, like our, our C directory and like deleting the startup file, auto exec bat, whatever they, they wanted to do. So that wasn't fun. Uh, the other thing that they, were, uh, that, that they were doing or what we found out is pretty much if you just mash your keyboard with a long password, the software doesn't care. It just crashes. It says, oh, yeah, thank you. A great username and password. Love you. Get in. Do anything you want. So uh, there's really no, no as, as expected, there's no real security on that. Now, one of the interesting things about this, and this could have been a false positive. We don't know really what was going on. In fact, um, had a had a friend that actually said, thought that since sometimes, and I messed up one time, but sometimes I was actually, I was mostly using like cloud-based servers or throwaway IPs, and, and I put my IP address on and the showdown actually saw saw the correct ports open but it classified it as a uh, CentOS. and i started thinking wow this is this is not a really great CentOS box it actually sucks for CentOS, right uh but uh but it could be like it started making us think like well how is the classification if you guys have done any type of os fingerprinting especially with nmap or anything it's okay i mean it works most of the time on m most of the new stuff but i never really tried it against the ms dos and we're finding out that the stuff doesn't really work too well so maybe showdown was having some issues or maybe it was just cash from something else. I, I don't know, but it makes you think on how accurate some of the stuff is. Maybe out there. just doesn't know old stuff. Yeah. I mean, it just can't accurate. So it's like, I guess, one benefit of using old stuff. Yeah. You can trick Shodan. Yeah. yeah. So um, the next operating system I had never really used. Has anyone ever used OS2 before? Like, uh, you haven't used OS2, man. Like, <laughs> all right. So, uh, Age well. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so OS two man, I uh, I had uh, never never really uh, really used it before, but it, it is actually a pretty badass operating system. Surprisingly, I can't believe I was saying that. It has some pretty cool things built in. So built in networking TCP stack right away. It actually had built in DNS and it had built in dynamic DNS DDNS. Uh, at least something that we could recognize be uh, you know shown as modern day DDNS. It had support for a whole bunch of servers. Granted you have uh, you have to have the right operating system on there. It had FTP server, it had a web server, it had a web designer that you could actually like interact with like some e commerce stuff on it. But what really, really sucked, okay, is when you try and install OS two, you'll find an ISO image out there. It doesn't work. It just like that, that shit does not work. Okay. So what you do is you find like this uh, archive of like like 50 different disks, and I don't know if you have ever tried to install like disk-based images. So what you, you first of all you have to use DD if you find the actual physical disk, create an IMG file, and then what you have to do in your your VM Fusion or whatever is you make sure you have to have an A drive because it doesn't work. So you actually have to create a floppy drive, and then while this thing is installing, like it, like you have to like go to the settings and select a new image and you would think it would go disk one, disk two, disk three. No, no, that would be too easy, right? No, it goes disk one, disk two. Please install and ins like set up this. Please install disk five. Go to disk one, disk three. Like, um, and like you know, 15 hours later, oh, it feels like an, like like basically living in hell. Uh, you finally get it installed. Yeah, yeah. So here's the interesting thing. Um, this is kind of the, I guess the research behind all this is when OS two came out, there wasn't like Apple didn't have the market share it had today. So like malware developers didn't really attack it. So there really wasn't a lot of malware that we found that actually even exists to go after this operating system. Not to mention that the system again is is pretty impressively secure. So you know we were kind of like, wow, this is you know thanks for coming out. Use use OS too. Um, but the challenge of that is, as we mentioned before, there's no like sandbox for OS two. There's no way to truly test the process level and stuff. So it's possible that some stuff is still happening on there. But to what we can see in the time that we ran it, it was pretty damn secure. And what was funny was that's where like uh, Amir was talking to somebody. We can't name the bank, but there are actually some banks. There are actually some people still uh, intentionally running OS two because of that reason. It's like they're kept a little secret of yeah, there's no malware out there because later on Apple got popular and that's when malware developers took notice to it. 
it. But at this, this window of time, there was really no malware for it, and it's somewhat secure, and it supports a whole a lot, a lot of features that they need for like basic IoT devices. Let's use this. So some people, there are manufacturers intentionally using this. And to be clear, this is not like... I talked to a lot of manufacturers that have like old saw mill systems that cut wood and like they're forced to use old operating systems because th- there's nobody manufacturing those saws anymore. So they just basically isolate those systems, don't put them online and just let them run old shit. I'm saying people are actually intentionally using this because it actually has security around being very old and obscure. So security when obscurity type of thing. So again, OS2 uh, was surprisingly... Uh, once you can go through the pain in the ass of doing it, it was actually surprisingly secure. But to have fun, we'll go back to Windows, and uh, you can talk about Windows 3. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and yes, yes, I know Windows 3 is actually DOS, like, sitting on top of it, so all this DOS stuff, like, like works out fine. It, it basically is DOS, right? I mean, yeah. so there's a, basically a win.exe file in, like, CWIN that, that like, runs this uh, old-ass, awful operating system as well, and, like, kind of the same, exact same problems of installing OS 2. Um, with, with Windows as well. Um, it just seems like there was like, just more default services turned on with Windows that are just easier to attack. And then once again, like I said, anyone can do this. That's, that's no fun. So that's why we gave this to actual like, customers or willing participants that uh, you know, they had services, you know, they had things like, and don't, don't worry, they didn't break any laws or put any, anyone's money in danger, but they were putting things, things like ATM machines as test beds or web servers or some IoT devices or controllers, and they were putting in some critical applications on the that were on the internet and they're like, oh, let's see how it gets hacked. They're like, this got hacked. This really got hacked. Your, your theory sucked that, that uh, no one would attack old school stuff because it's, it's all out there. And, um, and not only is it all out there, like what we found is just some of the basic things how people like do reconnaissance on machines, you know, like doing NMAP scans, doing just, uh, you know, some deeper scans. The, the, these boxes don't even survive that. They pretty much die on any type of denial of service attack and not, not only, you know, volumetric, but any type of application denial of service attack or anything as well. Um, and then I'll kind of let you... Yeah, to be clear, yeah, like, like protocol-based denial of service. Like people think volumistic. I'm talking like, like slow Lauren or something like that where you're just basically doing open handshakes. It will... It will die with one laptop. Yeah, apparently a ping is like very, very in- effective to crash like Windows 3. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, virus-wise, we had a, a, a ton of viruses come out there. But again, interesting enough, the viruses at this time were all like annoying where they weren't actually like real viruses. Let's see if this, yeah, these videos yeah, aren't playing. You have to click like select and no. They don't play? All right, let's do that. No, no that's actually, oh yeah, look at that. You're so nice. There you go. Hey, look at that. There's the virus. So that's an example of a Windows 3 virus. So what you don't hear, what, what was kind of cool about this virus was it was playing like the, the like made in the USSR song, like in an old 8-bit synthesizer. It was, uh, it was kind of had some pretty cool music in it. Um, and yeah. then it just like goes a little crazy. Now, at the time of Windows 3, Lord of the Rings was coming out, like the movies and stuff. And uh, yeah, basically we had this like Gollum virus come out and hit this one as well. So it's like, you know, basically, you know, having quotes from The Hobbit and stuff. But again, all these viruses are just like annoying where it was. It's really interesting. Actually, I'll go back. I probably can show the old viruses, too. So here's this one. Let's see if this plays now. Yeah, so select that. Why is it? Yeah, dumb? what I thought was interesting is kind of all the stuff in pop culture yeah. that we just think about today, like like Lord of the Rings or like yeah, uh, Terminator and stuff. I, I guess that was like, like I just happened to pick a time when with these operating systems when that was popular back then too. So uh, so all those viruses are like reference to like Terminator or yeah. or Lord of the Rings or LSD, which is still popular today. So there's the LSD one. Like imagine a computer becoming that. So you try to scroll around and everything. It's actually pretty creative that they can do that with the uh, the type of technology and turn your computer into that. So that's a mirror like scrolling around. He's just like, damn, this sucks. Um, here's the Terminator one. See, Terminator message. Don't be afraid. <laughs> I am a very kind virus. <laughs> you do. You have to do many works today. Probably not American or based in the U.S. So I will let your computer slow down. Have a nice day. So. That's the kind of viruses we're seeing with, with DOS and Windows. So what's funny about this is also when we had these things online, I told you it was about like for MS-DOS, it was about six hours before we had the, had the first uh, uh, you know, infection. The first infection I think we actually got was the Gollum virus. But it was yeah. like the, the guy that first connected to us, like, like within minutes, he's like, oh, I have this virus. So, so someone, just think about it, had that virus ready to go on their hard drive, ready to upload to an FTP server, right? I'm like, <laughs> wow, that's that, like how many uh, like MS-DOS boxes does he actually get run, run into, right? And he's like, that's it, right? And then like other 
but and then you know like 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 ten minutes later, the Skynet virus gets uh, like uh, uploaded, and same thing. It wasn't the guy was connected, and he waited for a little bit, found something. It was like he connected, like did a scan, and maybe like like ten seconds later, you see this thing being uploaded, right? And and then mm -hmm. he was even leaving messages. I was like, so like I just really want to know. I'm more interested in knowing like why did you have this like ready to go to upload, right? Yeah. Well, the other the other interesting note is you can talk about this as well as your ISP. Because your ISP flagged it, so you know ISPs have security in some in some fashion. Well, his ISP at least was able to detect what was it like code red or something. Yeah, yeah. so that, yeah. that was, uh, about that. was so so cool. so most of the time when I did this, I was actually doing cloud based services. I had like VM systems on different uh, hosting providers that I that I was remoted into. But like like every good malware researcher, there's a, there's a time where you say. Oh fuck it! I'm not gonna launch that that VM or whatever. Everything will be fine if I do it on my machine, right? And it's come on, it's MS DOS viruses, so it wasn't like I wasn't really too too worried about it. When, this was actually an XP issue, but um, uh, but then my ISP calls me up and they're like, "Hey, um, you know, we have this machine that no one really knows about. It's like like maybe Bob in this on the corner who's about to retire next month, but we put in the IPS system, an uh, intrusion prevention system to detect code red. Like, why the hell do you have code red running on your network?" And so I was talking. To them, apparently it was a really big deal when it came out. It actually slowed down their systems. It like took them down. They actually went through several like acquisitions and mergers. This ISP did, uh, but they detected code red and it like actually hit their systems and and they were wondering what the hell I was doing. So so that was that was interesting. Yeah. Well, they actually said it was one like one box. It's like we have one box yeah, left. Yeah, we have it was decommissioned. One. Still looking for code red. And now you give us a reason to keep it back up because you triggered code red. We thought we could shut this damn thing down, but yeah, I tried to have them t actually take a picture of that box because they, they said it was like literally hanging on the wall, like like suspended by like the like the like the power cable, and no one really knew what it was until they like found the one guy in the basement, I guess. But <laughs> it's probably a Pix from Cisco here. All right, so last one is uh, Windows XP. Now this one's actually been around for some time, uh, and it's actually surprisingly still used. So without any big shocker, this one got nailed pretty big. But it was interesting, again, like a lot of these older attacks are still out there. Uh, you know, your code red, your conflicker, as we were talking about. And even ISPs, because of how bad it was years ago, still have sensors on their network. And that's where that call came to your ISP, not mine. And uh, yeah, we were just like, really? You guys are still looking for that? So we were doing a lot of research on the side, and like on the Fortinet side, and uh, he was he found some of from his research side, kind of the stats of what's still out there. And surprisingly, like there's a boat ton of still old stuff out there. So the old saying, like once it's up online, it's up there for good, still applies. And that mentality should have you think about well, old technology versus new threats. Putting stuff online, you're not really worried about the new threats. You're worried about the old threats because the old threats still exist. The same concept applies to like ransomware. We, we started talking about ransomware in like 2014, 15, but ransomware has been around since like 1990. Like some of you may not know that, but like ransomware uh, has been around. It just wasn't a thing until like basically cryptocurrency came out. So you can actually get the ransom and not be like, yeah, uh, mail me a check. Let me give you my address and you can send the police to me. Or, you know, the whole idea of uh, exploit kits, which allows you to massively hit a bunch of people. Uh, the idea of dark networks where you can do the asymmetric handshake and have the uh, asymmetric key somewhere that you can't blacklist. These are the things that allowed ransomware to actually become a thing. But prior to that, there's old ransomware. So I bring this point up because if you run an old operating system, you may find some version of a 2004 ransomware that doesn't do the, like the actual like Bitcoin thing, but it's still ransomware and it'll encrypt your hard drive and, and threaten you. So the old threats are still out there. And really, the uh, in our findings, the big thing was looking at like all the operating systems and find like a sweet window like this the OS 2 one where people just weren't paying attention to it like outside of that like Windows Windows has always been a target like you need to update your Windows there's no old Windows that's going to be secure like maybe some obscure operating system will work but any old version of Windows will find that old version of ransomware or malware or whatever it is it's going to be and surprisingly enough well, you know, the other interesting part was a lot of the ISPs even still are, are looking at this, and even a lot of the research companies are still looking at this saying, wow, there's still rampant amounts of, of malware. Like, to Mayor's point, I'll be interested to know, like, what servers out there are still hosting this old malware? Like, that was the interesting part, and we were trying to find some of that, but it's, it's very difficult to, to phone back and figure out where the hell this stuff's coming from. Anything to add? Yeah, no. Uh, so, so that that's a good point. Uh, it's also it's also like the type of operating system. So even with XP, when we put in XP, like the first thing I did was a download it from from 
like MSDN, right? And uh, and it's it's a 64-bit operating system when you download it from MSDN. Nothing works on it, and uh, including the applications we were running. We're like, okay, well that's that's not realistic. Let us find a 32-bit version of XP. And then once we ran that, we're like, okay, this thing is really really old and it's it's infected. Just to go back to like this slide, you got to remember this is active. This is like basically as of like December and January of this year. People are still using zero access. People are still using like NJRAT. In fact, I was uh, actually talking to some researchers and they're like, yeah, we see hits on NJRAT all the time. I'm like, wow, that's like, like why would someone use that? Apparently it still works. And then same thing, like out here is like, like this stuff has been around for a while. Some of the libraries have been updated, but pretty much they're taking the port from MS-DOS and, uh, and making it work on your current systems. And most of it still works still on MS-DOS or Windows 3.1 or where, wherever it is. So, um, you know, as, as, uh, as Joey was saying, as how we detected most of these is we pretty much had these systems, like logically, at least the uh, external interface of these systems uh, with a public IP address, and then usually had them on like some sort of switch or hub where we were, we were copying the traffic, we were doing some sort of uh, PCAP capture, spam port uh, traffic capture. And then uh, we, were, we were running like tools, like so a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of vendor tools, what we found out is they're, they're not really detecting any of the old stuff, but they do have like cloud lookups or some sort of lookup service. And then, um, and then they'll start detecting that. But then what happens is for a lot of vendors is once they detect something like, uh, like, uh, like being hit all the time, then they put it into their active databases. So even at my work, they were like, hey, like, what are you doing? Like all of a sudden we have all this old shit like, like, like rising to the top. Yeah? And, uh, and of course they excluded all my, my serial numbers so I wouldn't like mess with the numbers or anything but but uh, we found out with a lot of other vendors were were doing that as well so at first it wasn't detecting anything then it started detecting detecting a little just attacks a second. so yeah you guys just to be clear like like IPS IDS 101 you realize you can't search for everything so basically when you go to a vendor any vendor out there doesn't matter who it is they they don't know your network so like they're giving you this like watch out for these 40,000 bad things but those 40,000 things let's say this lady here works at Walmart let's say you work at like the military you work at Sam's Hot Car Lot all three of different businesses so how could a vendor in general if I have an IPS say here's 40,000 things that match your exact network you can't do it it's impossible so the idea is you're going to have some stuff from Walmart you're going to have some stuff from Sam's Hot Car Lot that's turned on but has nothing to do with your network you got to tune these things this is the whole reason why we do tuning in the industry like there's, there's Fortinet Cisco Palo Alto any vendor you, unless you do a vulnerability scan and then look at what you're defending and then tune the IPS it has no idea I bring this point up because if you use the old stuff like what we're talking about all of the signatures by default are not going to be turned on for the old stuff and that was kind of our point is we have to kind of magically guess or you know know what we're going to be seeing because the, the signatures you get from these default products have no idea about old stuff and the same concept applies to like your network like kind of going on a side thing here, but I always preach about like do vulnerability scans, find your vulnerabilities and then tune the IPS, never set and forget like green is, is safe kind of thing. Because again, half of the signatures usually have nothing to do with your network because you're basically relying on a vendor saying, watch out for these 40,000 things that all my customers, Walmart, Sam's Hot Car Lot, whoever, all of our customers are using. So that was a big challenge for us as well because you know, those 40,000 signatures, none of those are protecting MS-DOS or Windows 3 or anything like that. So essentially we have this default IPS and we're just randomly picking signatures that we think is old shit that may, may fire, may not. But that's why we're saying we think nothing hit OS2. We basically highlighted a bunch of old OS2 signatures and hope and watch to see if they got triggered and none of them got triggered other than behavior analysis. But from a signature perspective, that's the challenge with using old technology with like a current IPS. Or someone's doing a whole bunch of like uh, ATM jacking and, uh, and on, on our, those OS2 systems and, uh, and uh, making a lot of money. So, uh, and we have no idea about it. Um, uh, what was interesting is we also had like people when, when we FTP was like one of the main services we used when we did this. We had people like leaving nice FTP messages like you guys are idiots running MS DOS thinking like like no one's gonna catch what you're doing. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting <laughs> as well. Um, so um, you, you know you know the new malware results right? Um, pretty much. So there's a lot of malware written for XP that started coming out written for XP. Any of this old malware written for XP pretty much works right after XP as well. You know, as long as it's like the right, you know, 32-bit, 64-bit malware, whatever it is. Um, the old malware is infecting like old systems when it's, when it's connected online, but, you know, there, there is that gap, right? Pretty much if you're XP, you're... From a malware standpoint, you're running a modern operating system. It doesn't matter how old it is. From most malware that started on XP will run today, even on Windows 10. Um, 
obviously there's caveats there. Um, what we also found is that Nmap, and this is why we were a little confused about the show dancing, is Nmap did, at least for the most part, fingerprint the OSs correctly. If they didn't fingerprint the OSs correctly, we got like generic OS or generic Windows, like it didn't, or uh, generic DOS sometimes, uh, which I hadn't seen before. And, uh, but we had all the ports and everything uh, open as well. Remember on the old operating systems, no real concept of like users or anything. So like everything's stored in one place. Anyone can access anything they want. Uh, once a user breaks into your system uh, and they essentially jailbreak out of the directories, their root directories, they can pretty much go anywhere. And even if you have any of the weak, weak uh, like security settings on this, on these FTP software, on the Telnet software, they can pretty much uh, do like overrun on it. They can just like put in a command so long it doesn't understand it and just goes right past it. All right, so to kind of wrap up this talk here, uh, you know, we actually thought that OS2 is cool. You know, again, we found that um, some IoT people are still using this. If uh, if you wanted to take away any value of uh, the research to say, oh, I can actually do something with this, um, it's basically maybe you can use this operating system. All the other Windows stuff, pretty much the uh, the old saying of upgrade your your Windows system, you definitely want to do that. There is no way uh, of uh, securing those. Like those operating systems are dead. That's why the newer versions came out. All the old malware is going to find it. The old malware is going to hit it. Um, well, we're, if you want, as we mentioned, we may uh, publish some of these images, but the only one that's really worth doing is probably the OS21. All the other MS-DOS images, they're fun to have if you want to like, put them up and watch people abuse them. If, you know, so be it. But other than that, there really isn't a lot of value. Like there's, there's uh, all the old stuff. We'll find it. We'll hit it. Maybe like Shodan, as we mentioned, maybe it'll get fingerprinted kind of off or so, but that doesn't stop uh, old malware from, from knocking it down. I guess the one thing is like if you when you walk away from uh, from DEF CON and when you walk outside, reporters ask you what did you learn from DEF CON. Tell them OS two is a shit, and just see what they say, right? Uh, so uh, OS two uh, is a shit and upgrade your Windows and upgrade Windows. Um, so that's like I said, it was uh, it was just a, like a side project that like, we wanted to do. We wanted to see. We actually we actually had a very different theory when we when we ended up. We were like having fun. We're like, oh, this is gonna be so awesome. No one's gonna guess what we're doing. Like all these systems are gonna be safe. And no, it it still sucks. Uh, I guess anything from Microsoft sucks. No, I, I didn't say that. I might need a job from them one day or something. But but no, just like I said, as Joey said, upgrades the systems is the reason why upgrades are there. Why patches are there and, uh, and have fun, I guess. Yeah. You want to add anything? That's it. All Appreciate right. Your time. We'll yeah. be here if you have questions. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, guys.